Thank you so much, Sandy. So our other presenter tonight, our main presenter, is uh, Barney Howell. And uh, he will be speaking on uh, analytical hypnotherapy. Uh, hypnosis can be divided into two main therapeutic approaches, directive hypnosis and non-directive or uh, regressive uh, hypnotherapy. Now uh, here, uh, Barney, in regards to his bio, starts off where he says he began his uh, studies in hypnosis in the mid-1970s while enlisted in the Air Force, primarily to improve uh, his performance in steel-tipped dart competition. And it worked, <laughs> he said. Uh, my professional use of hypnosis, meaning I was actually paid real money, began in 1983 after I retired from the military. People I worked with in the defense industry learned how I was helping with uh, weight control, smoking cessation, and asked me to work with them on various issues. Uh, 1980, 80, no, 98, excuse me, I'm blind as a case, sure, as you can tell. Uh, I decided I needed uh, some documentation that said I actually had a clue what I was doing in hypnosis. I found the Atwood Institute. I took the certification course with them, though I had had a good foundation in hypnosis. I learned two areas. I had not used really. Uh -oh. <laughs> Keeping your finger on there, really. Where is it? There it is. I had not used really or known about. They were um, a part of past life regression and their uh, theory of uh, therapy and uh, analytical uh, hypnosis. After completing training with the Atwood uh, Institute, I assisted Dr. Norman uh, <coughs> Charette in this clinic. Through Dr. Charette and Dr. Patrick Porter, I learned and became an NLP practitioner. Barney, please, we are anxious to hear what you have to say and teach us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's easier. 
Uh, when a client comes to us, what do we typically start with? Direct suggestion, right? Inferred suggestion. Just basically in, uh, suggestive therapy. But when you run into a blockage, the person may be making progress or maybe they don't make progress. There's an indication that there's something blocking success, blocking your ability to move forward with that client. So what we have to do is non-directly hypnosis, which is uh, using analysis, analytical. What I learned with the Atwoods was um, a technique that was based on transactional analysis. Who's familiar with TA, as it was called back in the 70s? Okay. Uh, and that was uh, Eric uh, Byrne, The Games That People Play. Are you, are you familiar with that book? Okay, it's a little old now, but it's still a very good book. And what Eric Byrne did was he came up with a theory for constructive human development that was based on observable behavior versus um, theory that Freud came up with. Freud had what? The id, the ego, and the superego, right? Eric Byrne said that within us we have a child ego state, which is born when we're first born. We have an adult ego state, which is based on our parents, which actually grows larger than parents, but based on our parents. And then we have an adult ego state, which we basically learn independent of that previous one. And when a person runs into a blockage, that's referred to as a parent-child conflict. We're not going to get into a lot because what I'm doing tonight is basically compressing what is typically about a four-hour uh, portion of a class into about an hour. All right? so, so bear with me a little as I go through this. So I started off talking about how we have a person come to us, we make suggestive therapy, and then we run into a problem, we run into a block. So to understand how those blocks occur, actually, uh, what I'll do is just use the handout. If you turn to the back page of the handout, there's what's referred to as the different ego states that we have. Now, a child obviously is a child, right? But the child has a parent, and the child grows into an adult. Those are the parent, child, and adult. But when we were first born, you're what? You're a child. That's the first you have. We say that humans are biochemically equipped to deal with two emotions. That's fear and anger. But don't ask me, Yolanda, don't, we can argue about that all night. Okay, because when I was first presented with this, I said, what do you mean, fear and anger? What about a teenager in love? I mean, you know, like, there's a lot of different emotions but that or, you know respond to biochemically. We respond to biochemically, but as a baby, basically that's all you know is either you're comfortable or you're uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, everything's okay. So the child ego state is the emotional state. One thing we call it is the I want state. A child wants to be comfortable, it wants to be cared for. So we call it the I want ego state. A baby, for instance, um, something frightens it or it gets cold or it's hungry, something's wrong. So what does they what do they do? They start to cry. This is part of the observable behavior, by the way. They start to cry. The mother comes or someone comes, takes care of it, and it's okay again. It wants to be okay, so it's okay again. But say, for instance, um, whoever's taking care of it is distracted they're on their tablet, on their phone, watching television, and they're not aware that the child is in discomfort. So what does it do? It starts to cry and cry louder. Right? Nobody responds. It cries louder. What actually happens, if you've seen a kid in distress, really, a baby, they start screaming, they turn red, 
their arms and legs start flailing. That's anger. Fear and anger. It's right there. Mother comes along, it's okay again. So the child is dependent upon the parent for protection. That actually impacts us throughout her life. Because whatever the parent says to the child, it goes into the child unedited, is what we say. It's just accepted. Whatever the parent says about whatever sort of food is to be consumed, whatever the religion is, whatever the, is supposed to be okay in the environment, someone raised a devout Catholic versus being a Muslim, or a Southern Baptist being a Mormon, they have different thoughts as they grow up, but they're based on the parents. So the child being dependent upon the parents, what do they do? The child conforms to the parent because the parent is who cares for the child. And one of the things that keeps the child in place is that dependency. And they have a fear of abandonment, either emotional or physical abandonment. So whatever the parent says to the child, uh, it's wrong to listen to rock music and dance. I don't know how many people have have uh, seen that, it's not so much prevalent today, but there are still places in some religions who actually say that. You're not supposed to enjoy life, basically. <laughs> so the child says, okay, I, I shouldn't do that. So the parent ego state we refer to as the I should or I shouldn't ego state. Okay, it's a I should or I shouldn't ego state. And as you develop over time, a lot of those beliefs that you learn at an early age <coughs> become permanent. And so as you get older, though, what happens? You start to develop your adult ego state. Now, an early example of that beginning to happen is a child being fed. Well, the child is, of course, dependent on the parents, and he gets food. So he starts eating it. Well, at some age, and I think you're like maybe two or three, the terrible twos, you know, the threes, they start learning that they have some effect on the environment. Maybe they're eating and they drop the spoon on the floor. Well, poor thing, you know, the mother picks it up, wipes it off, and gives it back to them, right, you know? Well, that's kind of interesting, the kid thinks, you know. Next thing you know, another time something falls off the floor. Eventually, they say, you know what? When something goes like that, they react. And so they start knocking things off intentionally and laughing, right? They are learning they have some independence. That's the first beginnings of the adult ego state. So the adult ego state takes information in, not from the parent, but from the world around them. This is where we have to get involved and somebody comes to us and they say, gee, I really wish I could dance, but I don't feel I should. It's wrong. I shouldn't do that. I can't have a candy bar before dinner because it's going to ruin my dinner somehow. I have to eat all my food on my plate because children are starving over there. I all the food I ate, I never saw any kids getting help. <laughs> but that's what we're told. So we end up with weight control problems, people end up with diabetes, because of the associations we have with food. First of all, whatever the parents told us. Secondly, all the associations with, with food. Is it just nourishment? No. It's birthday parties, holidays, picnics. <coughs> so we associate pleasure with food. That ends up being a problem for people. Again, I'm fast forwarding a little bit through some of this. So. What that means is when somebody comes to us and they have a problem that they want help with, weight control is a pretty common issue that we work with, right? Pretty common. So we start working with someone, and I'll mention maybe a couple of different people and how we ended up getting to the solution. That one lady I worked with was doing really well. 
losing weight. She had a major issue, though, at night. She had to have something sweet. She would, in her mind, she was being conservative because she would get the, uh, I call it the used bread rack in the store, you know, <laughs> the bread that's going out of date. And she would buy pastries and stuff from that because it was cheap. You know, I guess she thought there was less calories in cheap bread or something. <laughs> but, so she would have to have something sweet. Uh, there's times I say, have you ever been home and you haven't had something sweet? She says, no. I said, you've always had cookies, pastry, or something? Well, not always. I said, okay, so what about the times you didn't have something? She said, well, there was bread and sugar and butter. She had to have something sweet. So with hip, uh, hypnoanalysis, we would what, ask the person what sort of feelings and thoughts they have with that desire for something sweet. You've eaten, you're not hungry, but you can't go to bed without some calories, okay, sweet calories, all right? So we would take that and we say, okay, we would calibrate that person look at how the things that are going on with them emotionally and physically but thinking wise and take those back to when the feelings were brand new that's the easiest way go back to when those feelings were brand new didn't work with her when i learned analytical hypnotherapy the way it was first presented to me was that you know I'm a lazy person, my instructor. I'm a lazy person. I don't like doing work. If I wanted to work, I would get a job. So I'm a hypnotherapist. <laughs> exactly a psychologist, but anyway. He said, but I will tell you, any time suggested therapy didn't work, any time NLP didn't work. Now when you say didn't work, <coughs> most of the time it works some, right? But maybe when you get so far and you can't do it, go any further, you have to do something different. And he said, well, when nothing else works, this is pretty much guaranteed to work every time. But it is work. Do you find it harder than doing just a best of therapy? Oh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. It works. It does work. But it is a process you have to go through, and we'll go through the six steps that are involved with it. So I had to do that with this person. And what I had to do was find what's called the critical event. The critical event is the first time a person has certain thoughts and feelings involved with something. The very first time. Now you can find that, and so, unfortunately some people think that once you find the critical event, you're done. But you're not, because they're sensitizing events, things that are connected to and then reinforce that first event. So this lady, what we did was I took her back to the critical event. And we'll talk about that as we go through the process. Took her back to the critical event. And the critical event happened when she was three years old. She had no conscious memory of it. Now, one of the things I think any of us who do age regression, we know what, we can almost never know that what the person tells you they experience, if it's true or not, right? I mean, we say it's true if it works, okay? If the person comes out better for having the experience it, taking them through, then it worked, so it's true. But I'm not going to go off track because I, I tend to do that sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, so I took her back to the critical event. It was when she was three years old. And what happened to her was her sister, her older sister, about three years older than her, would go to her crib at night and show her candy, bright colored candy. And she'd even like give her a little taste of it and let her lick something, right? And then laugh and walk away. And she'd cry. This lady had no idea that had happened in her life, but she found out it was true. Why? You know why? She asked her sister. And her sister was amazed. She says, how do you remember that? How did you know about that? She says, well, I'm working with this guy, and 
or just Google. <laughs> Anyhow, that was a critical event. And that, you see how that, I mean, from all that time. Now, there were sensitizing events that went along, things that uh, reinforced the idea of sweetness. So you went through a pretty bad divorce, and that's where she really started to gain weight because she was using comfort food to kind of soothe her emotions. So, but there are a number of sensitizing events. Another example, um, in one of my classes, uh, we you typically would do a demonstration of going through an analytical session with someone in the class. And there was this one a, a psychologist. By the way, after I went through the presentation with her and she went through the experience that we did and found out the source of her problem, she told me she felt like she wasted four years in college. Because <laughs> this is pretty simplified. But remember, what I'm doing is very simplified here, even in a four-hour class. Transactional analysis is much more complicated than I'm presenting it here. Do you agree, Dr. Sir? Yes. Exactly. So, this lady actually started taking on our home study course because she had a little difficulty being in the presence of other people learning the things. So, she never really got started as some people at home study programs do. So she decided she wanted to convert and actually come into the actual class because if she had to come into the actual class, then she would actually have to do the work to get it done. But it was stressful for her. It was very difficult for her to come in and learn something new. And that's what it ended up being. It was her fear was learning something new. So in the class, went through the process with her, took her back. For the very first time, she had those uncomfortable feelings with learning something new. She was, we couldn't figure the exact time, but somewhere around two years old. And her parents were trying to teach her how to tie her shoes. At the time, they had no idea she was predisposed to be left-handed. And so they kept trying, and well, she was a little bit dyslexic too, but that's not an issue. So what happens is, and what she recalled while we were in hypnosis, now, when you go through this, particularly in a class, I don't ask them what's going on, tell me what happened, because a lot of times, you know, that can be uncomfortable for somebody. There's that, you know, privacy of that. But after the fact, you know, I tell them, hey, if you want to discuss it with me, or you have a question, or in the class, would you, you want to talk about it in the class? And she said, yes, yes, of course. And what she remembered was these two big giants standing over her, getting angry, red faced, pulling her, you know, no, you're doing it wrong, no, you're doing it wrong. There was her problems. Learning something new was that unpleasant experience. There was danger there. Remember, parent, child, child's dependent upon the parent, the fear of abandonment, physical, emotional abandonment. So, again, the critical event was the fear of learning something new. Of course, then in school, there were sensitizing events that reinforced that idea that, you know, it's, it's dangerous to do something new or experiment with some, some new things. After that class, and that's the only time I worked with her, by the way, we did actually get a recording for her afterwards that was uh, kind of the rehabilitation that we talked about. Uh, but what happened after the class, it was the class ended in December of that year. And in January, I got a call from her. She had started class back at the ASU. And there was uh, one of her professors who, uh, she was doing some graduate work of some sort, but one of the professors that she was working with was doing some research on hypnosis, using hypnosis therapeutically with people. And so when he heard that she had taken our class, he asked her if she would be willing to assist him on that research. She called me up on the phone on her way in her car saying, Barney, you never guess what happened. I said, what? She said, the professor called me. He's doing this research. 
He wants me to help him. She was all excited about it. How would she have been the previous September before the class? Probably would have said, no, she didn't like it. So these are the type of things, I mean, that are very simple, things that people really don't have in their conscious mind, that we can help them by uncovering those brief earlier experiences that still kind of control them today. And sometimes that's you have to do that. I, I'll give you one more real quick. You know you have to lay like thirty, right? Oh, I got a lot more to go. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I said I'm putting four hours in it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, actually, I think I'm going to be okay. We have questions, of course, on people, any questions you have. By the way, I have some business cards here. I neglected to put contact information on the forms. Even though I am retired, I am seeing clients uh, by referral primarily. I'm not advertising or anything. I don't have my 800 number anymore or the website even. But I am you know, doing referrals from people out in that area. And I work with. But if you have any questions, uh, and I've pretty much always been this way, particularly with my students. <laughs> She'll tell you she can call me any time. <laughs> and I still get calls from people, even in Canada and other countries, that have taken the course previously, even before I had this course. But the thing is, is if you have a question about any of this, I can't give you a class over the phone, but if you have questions, I'd be willing to think, go over it with you or help you through something that you might. But the one more that I was going to mention, there was a lady, another lady, a weight control problem. But with her, as with happens typically, and I'm sure everyone's had this experience, somebody comes to you with a problem, and you end up working with their, their wife, actually. People say, Barney, why don't you do life coaching? I said, what the heck do you think we're doing as the therapist? Are we not life coaches in fact? Okay, we just don't call ourselves that many. So, in the process of doing that, one of the things that came up was uh, issues with her husband. She knew he loved her. She said, and, you know, I really love him, but he drives me nuts. Now, that's unusual in a marital relationship, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, he drives me nuts. I said, well, all right, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, we went out the weekend at Richfield Park. They had an art fair and they bought a painting. And she lived in Pebble Creek. And they took it home that weekend. And when he went to work Monday, she decided, well, I think I'll hang it. And she said, I'm going to put it over there. So she went and she hung it. When he came home, she said, you're not paying the fine. He looked at me and he says, oh, well, you know, I had thought about, he got about that far and she blew up. Why? You know what she heard in her mind? You're doing, you did it wrong. You can't do it. You shouldn't have done that. And he... She told me, she said, he explained to her, said, no, no, no. I said, I was going to think, I was thinking about hanging it over here, but I actually agree, I think it's better here. It didn't matter, she still was angry about it. And she said, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of really affecting our relationship really badly. And they had been married, I think, about 20 years. You know, he was a ham radio operator, by the way, and I was one too, so I know he was a great guy. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> so we uh, basically we ended up doing an analytical session with her on that, and actually some other things too. But on that specific one, what ended up being was the reason why she was pushing him away all the time, and anytime he said something that wasn't 100% agreeing with her. She heard her mother's voice in her head saying, you're doing it wrong. And her mother did what? She used love as a weapon. If you, if you do it the way I want you to do it, I'll love you. If you don't, I won't. So what does a person do? 
If you don't want something taken from you, don't accept it in the first place, right? If he loved her and she said, ah, I do love you. And if he, say, wanted her to do something, she didn't do it. He said, well, I won't love you anymore. Now, his, her husband never did that. But her early childhood experiences were love as a weapon. Do it the way I want you to, or I won't love you. So those are, what, three examples? I don't think I need to do any more, right? You kind of understand where it's going with this. Okay. All right. So what is the process that we go through? We have three eagle states within us, right? And when I say eagle states, I mean the child. I want the parent, I should or shouldn't, and the adult is I will. Because I will, eagle state, is the one that can actually break the parent-child conflict. The parent-child conflict is something that's learned that represses something which is pretty much normal, safe, but you won't do it because of the previous programmings you had. So when a person wants therapy and we end up doing this process with them, we say that it actually incorporates a battle, if you will, I think the term we use, battle, of four ego states. Now if we have three ego states within us, where does the fourth ego state come from? Therapist. We operate out of our parent ego state. We communicate. That's why I wish I kind of had it. Child, parent, and adult. The therapist has a child. When therapy is being done, almost did it, huh? <laughs> um, we start off communicating with the conscious mind. And pretty much we consider the adult people to say the conscious mind. Right? <coughs> and so we're talking, um, I, I don't like learning something new. I'm, I'm really get in a state when I am faced with learning something new. So we start doing some therapy with them. That therapy involves going to the subconscious mind, the emotional mind, right? That's where our emotions are stored, that's where our memories are stored. So we communicate from our adult in hypnosis to their subconscious mind, given suggested therapy. Well, there is a link here between the parent and the child, learned behavior, early learned behavior. And we're not going to talk about repressed memory that's for you all, but what we will say is that there is information that's stored in this area that this may not be aware of. And that information stored in this area may be something that occurs between the parent and the child, but the parent is still conditioned, I'm sorry, the child is still conditioned by the parent. And when the child says, I want to do something, and the parent says, no, you shouldn't, read it. The child won't do it. We have clients that are 67 years old who are still held by that old learned behavior from the parent. So how, how does it hold this? How, how can after all this time, why is that link so strong? It's because of guilt. And we always assume, even if a client, when we get through this other part, even if the client says there is no guilt, we know there's guilt or else that wouldn't be there. So what we have to do as a therapist is go in here 
go through, find out what the parent-child conflict is, and then remove it, resolve it. Once this is done, now, because of this additional information that's come in from other places that we've learned. Oh, by the way, I was going to skip this, but I think it's important. The parent? Well, first of all, the mother gets the blame for everything, right? The mother's first on the scene. So anything wrong, the, mother's, it's the mother did it. Okay. But in actual fact, uh, not only the mother, older siblings, remember the lady I talked about with the candy thing? Um, eventually it becomes teachers, uh, the community around the person, people, you know, people who are, have some status in the community or something, the, the churches they go to, the ministers or whoever. So in actual fact, the parent evil state can get a lot of information in, and the, pretty much the information is reinforcing what the parents may be already established. So that that's comes in. But the other information, they go out, all their friends are dancing, having a good time. No, I want to dance. No, you shouldn't. I want to dance. No, you shouldn't. Maybe they go ahead and do it anyway, but they feel bad about it. I sometimes have ice cream before dinner, and I sometimes even sit there before dinner. <laughs> anyway, uh, so therapy is starts here. Now, we have to stay in our adult mind as therapists because uh, there's times in class that I've had people in there and we get to make children. And we're talking about working with children with hypnosis. And the question might come up and say, well, if you're working with a child and you suspect some form of abuse, physical or emotional abuse, is going on. What do you do? And the person who said, oh, I love children, I want to work with children. They said, well, I tell them you shouldn't. Or they may actually even go, well, I want you to. Are they doing therapy then? No. They're going into their emotional state which is not helpful because they're reinforcing some of the problems that that person may have. So it's important that we stay in the adult ego state more work and we have to kind of be empathetic but don't become overly sympathetic. And everyone with me okay? Mm -hmm. So that's basically uh, a diagram of what we do. Now, there are six steps in the analytical process. Each step is important. You don't want to miss a step. You don't want to leave something undone. Uh, analytical hypnotherapy, I typically will schedule two hours for it. I actually spent with one person, I think the longest I ever spent with one person was 10 hours. That's not in one day. <laughs> that was in a couple of different sessions. But they were very lengthy sessions for, for what we do. And it wasn't like, I didn't have any hypnosis for two hours. It was going in and out. It was actually going in and out. It was pretty good because it helps deepen um, the experience for them. And that sometimes helps get to the root of the problem. So when we start off, we decide, okay, it's time to do analytical hypnotherapy. I explain, and I typically explain to my client just this. I kind of explain the child, the parent, and the adult, and get to where they understand that, and they understand why we're doing what we're doing. So when we decide we're going to do it, um, everyone in here is a hypnotist. We don't need to talk about inductions and all of that sort of stuff. Right? But prior to actually starting the therapy, there's things you want to ask a person. Um, of course, as it says on here, typically the date, age, all that stuff. But nicknames they may have had, because just doing like age regression, you may regress a person back and they start telling you that maybe their name is uh, Carolyn or something, and 
now they're telling me their name is probably Cece or something like that. And they don't even, because of regress back to the age, maybe they don't recognize their adult name. So, so that's the thing in mind. Times to avoid. I had a client who had been burned when she was about nine years old. And one of the questions she had was why she decided to become a nurse. Uh, pretty obvious. <laughs> she spent in the hospital. So, but I had to tell her, even though that is a time that we won't specifically go to, if it has anything to do with your question that we're trying to find the answer to, you're going to end up there anyway. Idiomotor responses. Does anyone have a question? Do you know what, if now, idiomotor, not idiomotor? <laughs> we're not talking politics tonight, so we're not going to know that. Um, idiomotor signaling? Do you might have a question what idiomotor signaling is? Okay. We set up idiomotor signaling. Typically, I use finger signals. Alright? I don't, some people will say, this is your yes finger, this is your no finger, you know, and point it out. I just ask the person just to Set there, and particularly if it's another hypnotherapist I'm working with, I'm, I'm just saying, okay, give me a signal for yes. They're doing this, you know. That's not, that's a conscious movement. Give me a signal for yes. If you get a, you notice my pointing finger? I'm not doing that intentionally. Okay, that's my yes finger, by the way. Um, it works for you can ask yourself questions too. You know? Do I really want to play that one? <laughs> uh, but when I'm working with another hypnotist, even other clients, uh, not hypnotists, I observe the whole body. Because one time I had to get, I was getting nice finger signals from me, but for no, I didn't see anything. And so I kind of set this back a little bit further and asked him again. I went through the problem. Give me a signal for yes. Give me a signal for I don't know. Give me a signal for no. Or I skipped over no. Yes, no, I don't know, or I don't want to answer. Those are the three signals I look for. No, I never had a response. And then I realized what it was. I waited, and I noticed he wasn't breathing. His no response was to just stop breathing. I'm glad I didn't wait too long. <laughs> uh, another time, you know, I'm working with a hypnotherapist, and what happened with her? She was sitting there. I was getting, obviously, she was controlling things. But what she didn't know was her foot was you know, a little twitch like that. So observe the whole person and find out. Just see that it's repeatable. So you get, uh, yes, no, I don't know, I don't want to answer. Why do you want, I don't know, I don't want to answer? Anyone? Sometimes they don't want to answer. And so if they say, I don't know, you don't know one way or the other. Well, I'm sorry. If they say, I don't know, then they're telling, giving you some information. Maybe they just don't want to respond to you at all. You're giving them an out. They're going to, if you try to force the subconscious mind to give you information that doesn't want to divulge, therapy is stop. You'll stop getting responses from the person. So give them an easy out. I don't know, I don't want to answer. And if you get that response, then just move on. You'll probably figure it out some other way. When I put down here, other, oh, by the way, <laughs> this form here, when I made it, um, See that which says, Barney, I know you're ex-military. I am retired Air Force, by the way. I know you're ex uh, ex-military. I said, how's that? He says, you don't make a film for anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, for analytical hypnotherapy, there is no real script. I meant to bring, by the way, there's a book called uh, Analytical Hypnotherapy by E.A. Barnett. He's a French doctor, MD. And it is a great book. I, I really wish I had brought it with me. Do you remember seeing that? I showed you that. I have it. Well, I know you have it, but the book that I have, my yeah. copy, it actually fell in the bathtub one time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it with me. 
uh, it's beat up pretty bad, okay? But it is a great book. And the, the thing is, is that there are transcripts of going through an analytical session with explanations go along, because that's the best you can get by doing it, observing somebody doing it, or the transcripts that you see like that in the book. Because you only learn this by doing it. You have to do it over and over and over again. And you learn the steps. This I came up with because you don't have to keep looking at the book. There's, it's all here. And if you go through it step by step, you're not going to miss anything. So once you set it up for the idiomotor responses, you first thing you're going to do is you do an induction. And once you get an induction, basically, again, you're going to talk about their problem. Now, sometimes I just use the term, your problem. Sometimes I'll say, um, your desire for sweets. Uh, why you don't accept love from your husband. I'll use that the kind of term. So, we go back and we say, okay, we want to go back to do the first time that you had this experience. Pretty much the same as hip, uh, hypnoanalysis go back using the emotions to go back to the time. Um, I use more the hypnoanalysis way. I say, hey, go back to when those feelings were new. Another way of doing it, you get the yes or sorry, are you back there for the first time? Yes. Now, are you really there the first time? It's okay. Did it happen when you were 10? No. Did it happen when you were 5? No. I mean, you can play that. What was that game called where you kind of Pick the number, jump around until you got the right number. The easiest way to do it is go back there and ask them how would they work. Go back the very first time. Is it truly the first time or does it seem like you've had that experience before? Almost invariably, the majority of times, the first time they stop at is something that they told you about. Well, when I was 18, I broke my leg and I went and got some ice cream and my mother told me I was going to be a big fat pig. That was another one. That wasn't it. So I, I said, is, there, is this really the first time? No. Okay, go back a little further. Get back and you find, okay, fine. So once you get to the critical experience, you ask these questions. Does your subconscious mind want you to help? Usually it's a yes. It's frustrating when it's a no. But usually, and we're going to go through the easy way first. Does your subconscious mind want me to help? Because it really is important that the subconscious mind help. Because if it does, if it's a no, then you have to do the negotiation. Why is it that you don't want? Is it because you want to punish the person? Is it for protection? Why is it they want to hold on to that negative? Sometimes it's protection, sometimes it's something else. And then again, and again, these are the steps and some of these sub-steps. I may not always do that. If I get a response that the subconscious mind wants me to help, I may not go and ask if the answer come from your deep subconscious mind. If I get a no that doesn't want to help, I may then go, <laughs> did that come from your deep subconscious mind? Again, confirming that the subconscious mind really wants to help and is your subconscious mind willing to cooperate with me and get yes responses. And then you ask, is it all right for the subconscious mind to look at unconscious memories which are beyond your conscious memory? Now, tie on their shoe when they were two years old. That was beyond their conscious memory. So, yes, it was willing to do that. So you say, go back to the first experience that has anything to do with your present tensions, and when you're there, Again, you're verifying that they were at the first time. Now you've gotten cooperation from the person. You're saying, yeah, okay, this is what we're really going to go forward with it. Now, you ask them to review that experience at a subconscious level, and when it's done, give me a yes invitation. Sometimes you wait. And sometimes you wait. And sometimes you wait. I've waited as long as like 15 minutes. Now, at times I'll, again, I said, continue searching or review it. 
maybe you need to review it more than once. But most of the time I'm just quiet and I'm watching the person. You watch their breathe, you watch their coloration, because, you know, they may come out during that process because you're waiting. Maybe they're having trouble finding the experience or getting the details from the experience. But again, once they get there and they say uh, they've reviewed it, then you ask them again. And, and the reason we use idiomotor signaling is because verbalizing things, talking, is what? It's a conscious activity, right? And you want responses from the subconscious mind. So idiomotor signaling is the best thing to use. So you ask them, was that experience scary? Did you have fear during that experience? Yes or no? Did you do yes or no? Was it painful? Painful meaning physically painful. Was there any pain involved in the experience? Was there any anger? Usually there's anger, but not always. Guilt, remember what I said. You may get, no, there's no guilt. Yes, there is. <laughs> you could mark down what their response was. But typically, if there's, it's still there, there is guilt. Was there anything hurtful? Hurtful being emotionally hurtful about it versus painful, uh, physically was there anything hurtful? And then lastly, was there anything sexual about the experience? And again, remember you're getting the only responses. You ask them at the time, what time did it occur? Again, verification. And the next step is, is it would it be all right for the client, whatever the client's name is, to know about that experience in their conscious mind today. Sometimes you get a no. And even if you get a no, you work through it. You can work through it at a subconscious level. It may be too painful for them to bring up into their conscious mind and their subconscious mind is going to be more uh, The majority of time I find that it does come up that they can't know about it. Is it necessary for the conscious mind to be aware of it if you feel it at that level? No. Okay. no. There's, if we had more time, <laughs> there's another uh, thing you can do that when this absolutely isn't going to work, you use what's called six-step reframing. Anybody familiar with that? Anybody with NLP knows about six-step reframing? That, you can have a person come into your office and they say, I have a problem. Well, what is your problem? I don't want to talk about it. Okay, um, what have you done about your problem so far? Told you I don't want to talk about it. Can you help that person still? With a set, set briefing, you can. All you have to do is talk to them about their problems. Uh, <coughs> again, you ask about can they know about the experience now, and would it be all right for the client to feel all the feelings of the experience? There's a lot of controversy about ab reactions. I mean, uh, does a person have to experience the emotion and have the big outburst of uh, emotional relief? Sometimes, uh, my personal opinion is sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it will, but it isn't necessary. It isn't always necessary that you don't have to really create trauma in the of the person. But again, if it's all right for them to feel the experience, uh, then you ask, is it okay when you can you talk to me about the experience, meaning with you, the therapist? No? Okay, we'll move on. Or yes. And they may, you may bring them up a little, and they actually talk to you about the experience. Because that sometimes is helpful when you go back and start looking for the sensitizing experiences. Now, um, Understanding the repressed emotions and associated feelings of guilt. Oh, let me back up one before we get there. Uh, by the way, this is step number two, not three as it says on here. Step one on my on this was setting up the emotional responses. There are six steps. Look at two is one and three is two. I, I don't mean to confuse you. 
this is step number two in the actual six steps. Okay, when I, uh, the first step, identification of the uh, critical experience. This is for setting up an idiot when we're on in the step. N not, it's a precursor to actually going into the process. Okay, the actual process is six steps. Six steps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so step two is understanding the repressed emotions and associated feelings of guilt. Now, what we're doing is we're taking the adult, now, the adult mind, and help resolve this conflict. That's how we do this. We take the adult, all the learning that the person has, as it says here, I'd like you, meaning the client, Susie, uh, 20 years of age, take all your years of experience and understanding to Susie of uh, two years old. And when this is done, your yes finger will lift. Sometimes there's more information needed in order to do it, but basically the person in their adult state, because you've been communicating with them, and again, I don't do that, never first session with a client. Uh, rarely a second session. Usually it's at a third or fourth session before we get to this, or even later than that by the time we do it. So we've already had a lot of discussion, a lot of information that the client may have. Sometimes they have the information when they come to you. But sometimes this discussion up here between you and the client is imparting and, and working through consciously some of the things. So the conscious person knows, it's okay if I dance. I can learn something new. But they feel guilty. So to break that guilt feeling, this thing that's holding this in place, you have the information that this client now has, take it back to their two-year-old self and give them the information. Once you do that, then uh, step three, recognition of the current irrelevance of the previously repressed emotions. What you're doing is saying, okay, back then you were dependent on your parent. And you didn't dance, you didn't eat the cookie, you didn't do whatever it was that you were told that you said you wanted to do, but your parents said you couldn't do. So now, you as an adult know better, so you have them go back. I mean, they actually go back talk to their two-year-old self as an adult. Once you do that, relinquishing the, um, step number four, uh, relinquishing the repressed and repression emotions. We got up here again. Uh, once the client has agreed, you can kind of redo this because you're actually part of the working through that you're doing is getting the adult and the child communicating, imparting that knowledge. Uh, relinquishing the repressed uh, feelings and Repressed emotion, and the young client has agreed that those old tensions are no longer necessary. The client is today using all your wisdom and understanding would like you to find a way for the younger client to let go of these unnecessary, outdated, useless old tensions. When this is done, uh, your yes finger can look and let me know. Um, number five. Recognition of the resolution of the parent child conflict. This one, sometimes even when I talk about it, <laughs> you know, um, I can get a little emotional because to me, this is the most powerful thing and the most um, rewarding thing about doing what we do. Is when you see that person actually, you might say, integrate the, the child with the adult. You have that person, you say, okay, Susie of 20 years old, I want you to go to Susie of 2 years old. And I want you to make sure she's okay. Does she understand? Is she okay? Is she feeling all right now? Yes. Okay. So I'd like you to do something, if you would. I'd like you to touch her. Yes. Okay. Go ahead and just touch it. Push 
feel it? Yes. Can you embrace it? Yes. He said, okay, I want you to embrace her, to lift her up, embrace her. And as you do that, pull her into it. Okay, chill. <laughs> when I think of that, because you can see the change in the plant when it happens. Their breathing will change. Tears will be coming out of their, through their eyelids. It's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. It's a wonderful thing to see. But then, <laughs> rehabilitation. Step number six. This is the part I almost dread asking after all the work that we've done getting to that point. Is there any other part of the client who is not feeling okay? Are there any other experiences which is still creating uncomfortable feelings? No? Yes. <laughs> yes? Oh, crap. <laughs> because what do you do? You go back again to that sensitizing event, and you have to work through that. I, I can't even remember the max number we've done because I, I've not kept good enough notes to keep track of it, but I know I've had more than six sensitizing events that I had to work through. Not often, thank God, but we had one. Well, that kind of in a nutshell is the process, um, why we do it, uh, how it can work, uh, the benefits of it. Again, there's been more to it, and actually going through the steps, I'd like to have more time to do it, but again, I told you I'd just put into about an hour to four hours, uh, and usually, because usually there's more discussion during it, people will ask, well, what happens when you get an you Remember you called and asked me one time? Yeah. About, what, what happens when you, and I got confused. She confused me, because <laughs> she knew what she was talking about, and I didn't. <laughs> But anyway, uh, it, it, again, there's no script for it. This is the closest you're going to get to a script for going through the process. But just remember it step by step. If you get to the end and you get to number six and there's another part of the client that's not feeling okay, maybe when they were 15 or something like that, what you may have to do if you have another client that's coming, again, I schedule two hours for that half hour between, so it's like two and a half hours. You got a client coming, you got to finish up. I typically will set an anchor for a period of time in their life in between when they're feeling okay. You don't ever want to leave them, have them leave in an emotional state. Okay. Any questions I can answer real quick in about five seconds? <laughs> <laughs> yes. When you say, um, you think, you know, that there may be something else that comes up, are you talking about Okay, with the same um, problems they had, there's another sensitizing emotion. Where something else has been attached to it, maybe. Okay. okay. It's not the exact same thing, the first thing, like something sweet. Maybe it's, you know, um, uh, well, the lady actually, her uh, parents had gotten killed. And she had an aunt who started taking care of her and would pick her up from school, and every day she was picked up from school, they went by the gun shop. Again, the sweet thing. So that was a sensitizing event where sweet was something that you felt better by having. So that would be a sensitizing event. Any else? Any else? Yes. I thought you verbally mentioned a fourth ego state, and then... Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know what? I, did I not? Well, it's the therapist. It's the therapist. Yeah, it's I'm pointing my head. Yeah, it's adult. This is me, okay? Oh, okay. I have a, a parent, a child, and an adult within me. The fourth ego state is my adult ego state. That's part of the therapeutic process. These two, I can't go into my child or my parent. I can't tell them what they should do. And I can't tell them what I want them to do. I have to help them work through it themselves. Okay? You said you're meeting with an anchor, a health and anchor. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, can I touch you? Sure. I always ask for me. <laughs> uh, in, in my office, sometimes I'll just touch them on the back of the hand 
made a shoulder depending on how they're sitting in the chair. Sometimes I don't have them in the recliner. Sometimes I have them sitting in a chair like this. And I'll say, okay, now, remember the thoughts and feelings of how good you felt resolving those issues. You feel good. And you were too, you feel good now. Now, the next time you come in and you sit in this chair and I touch you on the shoulder like this, you're going to find yourself like that the next time. That's basically setting the trigger for how we need